Remember those great cars from the past? Oh, I mean it. And now it's just SUVs. Eh, no wonder people are saying that cars are better in the olden days. Thankfully, some manufacturers heard our cries and brought those good old legends back. The top seven best resurrected cars that we've been missing for over 10 years. Ever! Number seven. Picture this, beautiful Mediterranean weather, even more beautiful Italian roadster, and picking up your girl, who by the way is also beautiful. As they say, la dolce vita. The old Fiat 124 was your entry-level car into such a lifestyle. A distant cousin of La Da 1300, the 124 ticked all the boxes that mattered. It was small, fun to drive, and beautiful to look at. But it was a Fiat, and you know what that means. Fix it again, Tony. Awful reliability killed the open-top 124 as well as every other Italian or British sporty convertible for that matter. But now it's back and it's better than ever because underneath it's a Mazda MX-5. Not just that, it's also built in Japan by the Japanese workers, not some slackers who take two-hour lunch breaks. Here we take our time. There are of course some differences. It's slightly longer, wider, and much, much prettier. The retro-inspired design still works well even after all these years. The engine is Fiat's own 1.4 turbo, which makes a little less power and joy compared to the Mazda, but I'm not bothered by that because the MX-5 will remind you that driving is great, whereas the 124 will remind you that the whole life is great. Number 6 Oh, how the tables have turned, from a gas-guzzling poster boy to a car that even Greta Thunberg would approve of. The Hummer has gone through quite a transformation. They used to be these grossly oversized fake military vehicles that attracted people with small peepees and obnoxious personalities. Despite being semi-capable off the road, Hummers were a joke, and in the later years, no one wanted them. Fast forward 10 years, and now there's a waiting list for the newly announced EV model. It's still big and brawny, which is part of the Hummer charm, but because it's electric, somehow it's less of a jackass. Anyway, being electric adds a different layer of coolness. 1,000 horsepower, 11,000 torques, in three seconds to 60. You can't argue with those numbers. This Hummer is no joke. It works better in the wild, too. Thanks to rear axle steering, it can drive around tight corners or drive diagonally, like a crab. It can also be raised by an additional six inches to clear boulders. Or not. You can just flatten it with the full underbody armor. There are even cameras showing you what you're driving over. The roof comes off too, for even more immersive outdoor experience. And lastly, the Hummer EV looks great. Less like a fake army vehicle and more like a lunar excursion rover. I like it a lot. Hmm. Number 5 The A110 rose to fame in the early 1970s as a successful rally car. Its 1.3-liter Renault engine wasn't the most powerful of the bunch, but thanks to the car's low weight, compact dimensions, and mid-engine layout, Alpine swept the floor with the competition. And it was absolutely gorgeous. Nearly 50 years later, Renault, with some help from Caterham, decided to revive the long-dead Alpine with the modern interpretation of the A110. And well, here it is. Still very handsome, but more importantly, true to its original recipe, performance through lightness. But it's not bare bones either. You still get all the usual amenities. Compared to its main rivals from Porsche and Audi, the Frenchie is up to 40% lighter, and that makes a huge difference in the corners. It's lighter on power too, but the Alpine engineers never really cared about lap times or zero to 60 anyways, so it doesn't matter. The A110 is tuned for road use. It's a smile machine, not a brag machine. I'll give you an example. Many sporty cars have longer gears, so they hit 60 miles per hour more quickly. But in Alpine, they did the opposite, so that you can hit the rev limiter sooner. It's about the joy of driving, about impressing you, not you. Number four. What is with all the Thunderbird hate out there? I think most people have it wrong when it comes to the latest T-Bird because it is, in fact, one of the best revivals ever. Generation after generation, Ford was turning the Thunderbird into literal crap before they realized, hey, maybe we should look at what it was that made this car such an icon in the first place. The original Thunderbird was a big, long, comfortable cruiser with stylish lines, a brawny V8, and a retractable roof. It was focused more on comfort than speed, and oh, it outsold the Corvette? When the new one came out, it was a modernized clone of the first generation, 
The design was a line-for-line copy of the original. Hood scoop? Check. Forward-leaning gills? Check. Pothole window? Check. Entire front? Check. The lines even tapered down towards the rear to give it that art deco sense of speed. I don't really understand people who say that the Thunderbird is ugly, but hey, that's their opinion. What I won't allow is T-Bird being trashed for not being sporty enough. It never was. It was never meant to be, Doug. The 280 horsepower V8 with lots of torque is perfectly fine. The automatic gearbox is what you want in a car like this. And so is the softer suspension. It's a cruiser, like a budget Wraith drophead. If you ask the owners, they seem to love it. And I do too. Number 3 I have a confession to make. Calling the Aussie HSV Malou stupid was wrong of me. I got so held up on that official marketing photo with the work tools in the back that I just couldn't see past it. That's fucking stupid. I mean, really. Anyway, Malou is a coupe that traded the rear seats for more trunk space so you can put the surfboard or barbecue or Jesse Pinkman in the back. What Malou also is, is a modern El Camino. Think about it. It shares the chassis with a Camaro, has an LS engine, and, well, everything else Chevy since HSV is actually owned by GM. So don't be fooled, this is a 2016 El Camino with some wrong badges and a steering wheel at the wrong side. And this time around, the Camino wasn't just some aggro truck with a big engine. It's a proper performance machine with magnetic suspension, AP racing brakes, torque vectoring, launch control, and the option to pick different driving modes. Oh, and it had a supercharged V8 from the Camaro ZL1. You know, the nastiest Camaro ever made. But despite all the serious racing parts, most Malou owners were interested only in running it between the lights and making a lot of smoke. Seriously, why wasn't this imported to the country known for its love of trucks? Number 2 Some may argue that the 2004 GT is a better pick. It looks about the same. The engine was a big V8 and even Carl Shelby was involved in its development. But I feel that the first generation was more like a tribute to the GT40. The second generation, however, was a revival of what made the GT40 so great in the first place beating Ferrari on a track. This new GT is a race car first and a road car second, just like the original. Everything is performance oriented. Twin turbo V6 is a better choice than a V8, dual clutch gearbox is faster than the manual, and extensive use of carbon and aluminum made it lighter too. And most people in Ford didn't even know that it was being developed. Right under their noses, a small group of hand-picked engineers was prepping for something very special. The 50th anniversary of Ford's 1-2-3 victory on Le Mans, where Ford humiliated Ferrari after Enzo insulted them. Hard. And so, on June 19, 2016, the American secret weapon was suddenly unveiled, painted red, white, and blue, standing proud at the starting line, next to its old rival, the Ferrari. And then it won. Again. That's right, Mia Michi. Don't you ever forget who can beat your ass whenever they feel like it. Number 1 What a sight that was. 2006 Detroit Motor Show with three of the iconic muscle cars revived in all their glory. None of the rebadged Mitsubishi or Catfish or Fox Body BS. These were the old school mean machines. But to me, one stood out among them as the ultimate muscle. The Challenger. Years passed, and Camaro and Mustang became more, let's say, good in the corners. They had the hardcore version that would chase down Porsches around the tracks. Really? Muscle cars? Dodge never bothered with any of that. If you want to attack the corners, get a Viper ACR. But if you're checking out the Challenger, then you're probably just interested in straight-line performance. Isn't that what muscle cars were all about in the first place? And like before, there are many versions of the Challenger to choose from. A V6, which we'll ignore, and 485 horsepower RT, 700 horsepower Hellcat, 800 horsepower Red Eye, and finally the 840 horsepower Demon, which can pull off a wheelie. Interesting thing about the Demon, the supercharger alone is 2.7 liters of displacement. Ridiculous? Maybe. But the sales numbers show that Dodge knows what their buyers want, and that is brick shaped power. 